And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PrunnerCast. Yes, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at printermedia.tv. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another weekly episode of PrunnerCast with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. How are you, mate? How's things? I am pretty good, I have to say. Pretty excited about this show, given that the, the guest that you have had a, one, of your, uh, one of your conversations with. We'll uh, talk about that in a second. Absolutely. A little bit of fanboy, are we? Uh, you know I am. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. Cool. Um, what, uh, what's happening this week? Oh, mate, plenty of amazing stuff going on. Uh, I'm getting a lot of sleep, much to the chagrin of most of my friends when I tell them about Eli. But, uh, you know, so far so good, which is, uh, which is awesome. Excellent, excellent. Glad to hear the family is well over that side of the world. Um, we've, got, we've still got a couple of these, um, these projects kind of looming around in the wings that I'm, I'm getting right on the edge of talking about. Um, <laughs> but we just can't quite kind of like talk about it just yet which is is somewhat disappointing but very helpful in in that uh the interview we've got this week is a little bit longer than usual so i'm going to cut this intro short not that i'm the one normally to cut anybody short mr williams um but i do want to ask you because we had a lot of interest um since we picked up asking about your book of the week I do want to ask you if you've listened to anything interesting this week on your uh your audiobook collection yeah, well, it's actually uh, something probably a little different than, than usual. It's uh, an autobiography, or sorry, not an autobiography, a biography on uh, Thomas Edison, which has been uh, really cool. It's Ooh. a two-part audible audio book, so it's quite long, but it um, really goes through Edison's life, everything from sort of early on days all the way through to sort of uh, the end of end of it. And it's really quite interesting to sort of see how um, poor a businessman he actually was. He was a great inventor, but not a great business person, and that was a no, really is key thing I took away from that. Um, the book's called The Wizard of Menlo Park, because Menlo Park was obviously where his, um, I guess, factory, studio, laboratory was. Um, and it's a really cool book. It sort of just, you know, covers that. I think I've spoken about uh, one of my favorite books last year was a biography, biography on um, the world's most famous magician. And, um, you know, this is sort of a, a, on those sort of lines. So it's been pretty cool. Excellent. I, 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 I always like it when you bring out the, the, the kind of non-standard ones out of your collection because, as we always say, there's always something to learn from everything. And it was interesting. I mean, I think a lot of people w- would, would reflect that Edison was an incredibly successful person, but, but it's interesting to see that the book kind of puts across that he wasn't that great a business person. Mm, it was interesting because um, he was very good friends with um, Henry Ford, and Henry Ford basically, yes. I think it was Henry Ford from memory, kept just throwing money at him and just helping him out, which was really interesting. Yeah, it's interesting that that story I came across through Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill because it's mm-hmm. referenced in there. Yeah. Um, so, cool. So, folks, um, as we do recommend, Pete, Pete always listen, pretty much listens to everything um, on audio book. We get our books from Audible, the audio book company. And as always, the offer still stands. If you're a Preneurcast listener, you can get a free trial of Audible if you're not already a member. Um, at, by just visiting audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast. Um, and we recommend this week that you go and get hold of a copy of The Wizard of Menlo Park. Hmm. Uh, and I certainly will be doing, because uh, that sounds really interesting. So I'm very excited. I'm, I'm sorry, mate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push ahead to this interview because it's, uh, it's a big thing for me. Uh, you managed to have a chat. And, and managed, I think it's pretty much a, pretty much a, an accurate description of this. Actually, you managed to have a chat with Michael Port, author of Book Yourself Solid, and quite a few other books, by the mm. way. But uh, most famous for Book Yourself Solid. But um, it was a bit of an ordeal all round, really, wasn't it? <laughs> it was a little bit. He was uh, living it up large on his boat during the time of the interview, but a, a storm kind of hit <laughs> as we were chatting, so uh, it made. A lot of work for you this week to sort of edit up the audio and uh, we had a couple of, uh, I'll call them hiccups, throughout the process of having the conversation recorded. So you had to sort of edit and clean up a fair bit of bits and pieces. So uh, I think it sort of, you know, comes together really, really nicely and there's a lot of great value 
in the conversation I had with Michael, but it was a bit of an ordeal for you. Yeah, but it was absolutely worth it. So uh, I won't hold out, hold people up anymore. Let's get right into your conversation with Michael, and uh, we'll we'll come back and have a chat about it after everyone's listened to that. Well, Michael, thanks for joining us, mate. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> this is uh, close to our, I think, almost around our 100th episode. And I do think this is probably going to be the first conversation I've actually had that my wife's actually going to listen to. She's a, a, oh. she's a huge Sex in the City fan, so I mentioned that I was uh, chatting to Mike <laughs> from Sex in the City and she thought that was very strange. <laughs> 1997 I recorded that episode I know it's completely irrelevant to the, the, the meat of what we're going to talk about but um, I'd love to sort of for people who don't know the story about um, your background and, and how you were an actor and on Sex and the City for an episode uh, as a lead character I guess in that particular yeah. show can you sort of tell yeah. me about your background then we'll get into the book and, and all the good stuff sure you know interestingly enough it's actually not um, irrelevant uh, it's I think very irrelevant certainly to the work I do now, and I think to the topic uh, at hand, which is, you know, how to get as many clients or customers as your heart desires. Yeah. I started my professional life as an actor. So I went to college and I studied acting. Then I went to graduate school and I studied acting. And uh, then I came out and I had a modicum of success, meaning I was doing all right. Um, I was on, as you said, uh, Sex and the City, Law and Order, Third Watch, All My Children, and um, a number of other uh, shows that you would have seen or films. And I did a lot of voiceovers to pay the bills, but um, I was not so mature at the time. And I didn't really like the idea of waiting around for other people to give me jobs. You know, <laughs> yep. that, that's it. it also just didn't fit my personality. I've never been accused of being patient. <laughs> so, so, um, uh, so I decided to leave and I, I was able to talk my way into a job in the fitness industry and I was uh, very fortunate. I had some success there because uh, I'm very strategic in the way that I think and I'm very process-oriented um, and systems-based in my work. And uh, the work that I went and did um, uh, really needed an overhaul uh, in that department. And it was, it was, it was selling memberships to gyms? Is no, that, no? No, I was on the uh, – at first I was running group exercise for a company. Uh, we had um, – we had nine different, um, very high-end, 100, 150,000 square foot clubs throughout the country. And, um, and then I went uh, into operations in senior management uh, for another company. And then I left and I went back in entertainment as a VP of, um, of a small entertainment company. And then I went out on my own. But the reason I say that the acting is relevant, and even the fitness, because a lot of, um, a lot of what I was responsible for uh, managing were experience-based events. Mm -hmm. And the same thing when I went back into the film industry uh, on the production side or exhibition, exhibition side, really. So, you know, performing is all about creating experiences for folks. And as an actor, you are always trying to achieve a goal. You know, you, when, you're, when you're working on, as an actor, when you're working on characters... You're trying to identify, what does my character want? What do I want? What do I want? What do I want? And then your job is to go and get it in the um, confines or structure of the script. Mm. And if you think about marketing and copywriting, et cetera, getting people to take an action of some sort, you got to be really clear on what you want, what you're trying to achieve, what's the goal. And you've got to be very creative about how you get people to take that action so that you achieve that goal. And that's very similar to what actors learn how to do. Mm. And in the process, an actor is creating an experience for other people to watch. Absolutely. And the experience should be relevant and entertaining in some way, either in a dramatic way, a comedic way, etc. And when you're marketing a business, when you're trying to sell products and services, you want to create an experience for the people um, uh, that you're trying to get attention from so that they want to pay attention. And if you know how to do those two things, create experiences that are really relevant to the people you want to serve, and you know how to you know, uh, um, sort of 
um, dis, uh, um, analyze uh, your work, just like one would analyze a script to figure out, well, what actions uh, am I trying to get people to achieve? And how am I going to go about achieving those while creating an experience for the people that I want to serve that's relevant to them? You'll, you'll start to find new ways of being as a marketer. Mm. Absolutely. And well, something you write about that, 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 I, that came up to mind as you, as you were speaking there is you, you talk about in some of your books about the, the why people buy what you're selling. And it's sort of, I guess, a bit of a, a, a bridge to what you were just talking about to, to that sort of topic. Can you talk about that a little bit about what, what you write about when it comes to you know, why people buy what you, it is that you sell as a marketer, as a business person? Sure, absolutely. So in order to understand why people buy what you're selling, you need to start with a very specific target market. Now, I'm sure most of your audience knows what a target market is. Many of them probably have a target market. Some of them think they have a target market but don't. I think it's more the latter for most people that I come across. It's, it's, it's strange. People like, understand the definition, but when you really try and delve into it, when I do consulting sessions and things like that, it's, it amazes me how often people don't have pure clarity on what their target market actually is. Yeah, I, agreed. Um, you know, and there's a few reasons, I think, and I understand why people have a hard time often uh, making this very specific choice to serve a very specific, seemingly narrow group of people. And one of them is because... They're afraid that if they make this very this seemingly narrow choice, then they're going to miss out on opportunities. Mm. And the opposite is, in fact, what happens in reality. You know, if you're all things to all people, um, people don't generally pay attention to you in the same way that they, they would if you are dedicated to serving them. So if you think about it, here are three reasons you need to target market. Number one, so you know where to do your marketing. Because if you know where to do your marketing, then you can be very intentional about the work that you do. And then if you're doing your marketing in the same places, the aggregate of that, uh, uh, that work produces a lot of attention. But if you're doing a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit you know, everywhere, uh, it, you don't build up enough um, marketing material out in the world to get any attention. So when you have a very specific target market, you know what associations they belong to, what clubs they belong to, um, who their influencers are, what they read, etc. And you can start showing up in those places. You can connect with those influencers. You can speak or write for those associations, those clubs. You can go to those events. And as a result, you can, um, uh, you can be very focused about your marketing and produce a lot more in, uh, in a few spaces. Mm -hmm. Number two, when you show up there, they know you're dedicated to them. And that's critical. Because who do they want to work with? The, with the person that will work with anybody that, you know, has got a pulse in a checkbook? Or the person that's dedicated to somebody just like them, knows their world, knows their field, knows their industry, knows them like the back of, you know, their hand. And then finally, number three, they already have established networks of communication, meaning they're already talking to each other. So they can spread your messages for you, and they're talking to each other through these groups, through these influencers, through these very specific, specific places that they hang out. Now, oh. if, if you still feel like, well, I kind of want to be all things to all people, um, you know, I don't really want to make this choice yet, you absolutely can do it. it. You know, and you can get booked solid. I'm not saying you're not going to, of course, but generally it takes a lot longer. It yep. takes a lot longer. Look, you know, I, I'm uh, I'm on my boat right now, and I've got Cummins two two Cummins diesel engines, right? Mm -hmm. And when I when I have someone work on the boat, I have a Cummins certified mechanic work on those engines. Mm. I don't have a regular mechanic. That regular mechanic might be able to do just as good, even not a better job. But I'm not going to give him the chance because his specialty is not Cummins. I want someone whose specialty is Cummins. Absolutely. It was all about that special, specialty skill set, or at least specialty positioning anyways, is, is the big thing. Yeah, so, you know, then, so there's two things. There's the target market, and then there's the specialty that you bring them. Yeah? Yeah. So if I was that, if I was that Cummins mechanic, I would choose a very specific target market, a very specific um, kind of boat owner with specific size boats, types of boats, region, etc. So, because look, my closest friends here at the marina 
all have boats similar to mine, and three of them even have the same brand. Yeah. And so, guess my the, my my uh, slip uh, neighbor right next door to me, his boat right now is down at a service station um, about twenty nautical miles from here, and it's the first time he's been there. Uh, but guess why he's there? Recommendation. Of course. Yeah. I said you got to go 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 over to Eric's shop. You're not going to get you know uh, messed around with. He's going to tell you straight. Blah blah blah. And that's where his boat is now. So, um, you know, it just makes it so much easier for people to refer because I know these guys are specialists and will be able to do exactly what, uh, what you know, what Andy needs. Hmm. Right? Well, absolutely. Well, something else, you know, obviously referrals are a huge part of, of, of marketing your business and, and, you know, putting yourself in a position so referrals can actually happen. Something else you talk about, which I do love to sort of, I guess, you know, help increase business and revenue for something is this keep in touch strategy. Hmm. Uh, I really love that, and obviously you talk about it in the books and things. And I want to get into the illustrated version of Book Yourself Solid, which just comes out a, a little bit later. But can you talk about the, the keeping st- strategy a little bit as well? Give people a bit of a teaser for what they'll get when they actually grab a copy of the book. Sure, of course. So there's two aspects to your keep in touch strategy. You're keeping in touch with past clients, so they become current clients. You're keeping in touch with current clients, so they stay current clients. You're keeping in touch with potential clients so they become clients but you're also keeping in touch with your network yeah and your network is generally where many of your referrals come from absolutely in fact often I'm told by very successful service professionals that the majority of their referrals come from other professionals now the first assumption somebody might make is well, that means that their service is not very good because their customers or their clients aren't recommending them. Not necessarily. A few friends I have in the town that I live in, they're not generally moving homes a lot. I mean, that happens like once every five years. Mm-hmm. So as much as I love my realtors, I don't have a lot of referrals for them. So where do they get most of their referrals? And certainly they'll get some from clients. I think I sent them one or two you know, over the past eight or nine years, but they're going to get most of their referrals from other people that serve their same target audience. Yeah. So, so we need to make sure that we're spending as much time developing deeper relationships with the people in our network as we are on keeping in touch with past clients, current clients, and future clients. Mm. So, and, and we look at these strategies in slightly different ways. So, Let's look first at keeping in touch with the people in your network. So when I think about networking, I think of it from that perspective. Keeping, making, developing deeper relationships with people in your network, people you already know. Yeah. That's different than trying to go out and meet people that you do not know but would like to know. I call that direct outreach. You're trying to get to people and maybe they're potential clients, but maybe they're people who can open doors for you, referral partners, you want to get booked to speak somewhere, an editor, you know, those kind of things. Um, and so I, th- I think that, that the way that you deal with those people is slightly different than the way you deal with, uh, with people who uh, pay you, who buy from you. Yeah, absolutely. And so there are four things that I recommend uh, you do every day. And it takes about 10 minutes, so it's not a big ask here. So the first thing I suggest you do each day is introduce two people who do not yet know each other, but would probably find each other relevant, either personally or professionally. So, you know, you say, hey, uh, Steve meets Stan, Stan meets Steve. I know you guys are both scratch golfers, always looking for a fourth. uh, And, you know, you never invite me because I suck. So, (laughs) um, you know, maybe uh, you want to connect with each other, you know, never know, play some golf. Peace out. See you later. That's it. You know, and it's not your responsibility to make sure that they connect if they do. Great. If they don't, fine. No problem. Now, it might be something uh, professional. You might introduce um, a realtor and a mortgage broker because there might be a good connection there. You might introduce two people who recently opened similar businesses but in different parts of the country because you just happen to know these people. Um, So, you know, you're just finding – look, if I could take the word marketing out of the dictionary, I would love to. I'd love to replace it with the word relevance because all you're trying to do is be as relevant as you can possibly be. Mm -hmm. That's what you're trying to do. And if you're introducing people who might find each other relevant, then you're irrelevant. It shows that you're thinking about them, 
that you care about, you know, their future, their well-being, the things they're interested in, and of course, um, that you know what's relevant to them. And that's pretty cool because most people don't pay attention to others. Not at all. And if you do, then you really stand out. It's amazing that that would make you stand out, but it does. So, so that's the first thing I suggest you do. The second thing I suggest you do each day is share some information with at least one person in your network and by way of an article. Maybe do two people. Let's just do two for math, and I'm going to do the math in a minute, so you, 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 I'm building to, a, to something here. So you, you, you share an article with at least two people each day. So you say, so Pete, do you, you have a particular hobby? Yeah, a triathlon, so I run and swim and all that sort of so, stuff. So let's say I, I'm reading the New York Times and I see an article about triathlons. And, um, and I find it pretty interesting. It's about some new sort of technology that people are using on their bikes for triathlons. And I, I say, hey, uh, I send you an email. I say, hey, Pete, um, I saw this article. Now, mind you, maybe we did an interview a month or two ago, right? So we're not, we just met each other. So mm-hmm. we don't know each other outside of this, but now I know that you're interested in bikes. I mean, in, um, in triathlon. So obviously you're interested in bikes if you yep. do triathlon. So, but I send you this notice. I remember that you said you uh, did triathlons. I saw this interesting article about triathlons. Uh, have you seen it? If not, here's the link. What do you think? Mm. Something I actually now, do, a, a slight tweak on that, which I, I think, you know, has been molded off reading your book years ago, is using services like um, Help a Reporter Out, Harrow, um, yeah. which you might feel familiar with. I actually read that every day, obviously, for our own uh, exposure opportunities. But then if I see something in that in that, that daily Harrow's opportunity list that I think could fit with a colleague or a friend of mine, I'll actually yeah. send them that media opportunity, which shows that I'm, I'm caring like you're talking about. But there's also extended benefits for them and their business because they might end up getting exposure and, and some publicity off the back of it as well. So it's a, it's a, a variation on, on that technique that I use quite a bit. It's brilliant. It's mm. exactly what we're talking about. Yep. I love it. You know, basically anything you can do to be relevant to the people that you want to develop deeper relationships is the key. So if you're sending articles or you're sending opportunities, hey, I just noticed this thing, this might be perfect for you, um, or you're introducing them to others, or, and here's the third thing, you're sharing some compassion. Mm. That's, you know, uh, I say, hey, Pete, I I, uh, heard you got in a bike accident. I'm so sorry. I hope everything's going well. You know, anything I can do, let me know, right? Whatever. You know, you're, you're, you're always, you, you find at least one person in your network to do something extra special for. Send them a card, send them a gift, you know, send, um, send them some brownies, you know, what, as long as they eat brownies, right? Someone <laughs> sent me brownies recently. I don't eat sugar. So, you know, uh, and everybody knows who knows me that I don't eat sugar. So that was an easy one to find out. Yeah. But so then, uh, then I got to, I got to give the brownies to somebody and I feel bad that next time they see them, they're going to realize I don't eat sugar. And they'll be like, what? I sent you the brownies. Shoot. Right. You know, so, so, uh, so it's one of those things where you just do your best to, to try to find out what's relevant. Yeah. And, um, I mean, look, every day you're trying to be as compassionate and, uh, and supportive as other people as you can be, but go out of your way to do something extra. Now, let's say you introduce two people, you share articles with two people, or you share an article with one and a horror thing with another, and then, um, you share some compassion with one. That's five people a day. Yeah. Over the course of five days, that's 25 people. Over the course of a month, that's 100 people you're keeping in touch with. You think if you had 100 people that had some influence in your industry that you kept in touch with every single month in this way that was very relevant, it'd be good for you getting business? Yeah, it's undoubtedly. And it's such an easy thing to do, which, which is what I love about it. So here's, but here's the thing. So even though it's super easy, uh, a lot of people don't do it. And, and I've been so discouraged over the years, you know, and I don't get easily discouraged. But this is one of those things that I felt like, Man, if I could just get everybody that I serve to do this, they wouldn't have to worry about too much marketing. I mean, Mm. this alone can get you booked solid and help you go beyond. But, you know, it wasn't happening. So I I worked for two years on creating a software program. I I paid for the whole thing myself, had two developers working on it. And then I got approached um, about five, six months ago by a company called Contactually. And they said, hey, we love what you're doing. We want to take your protocols, your book yourself solid networking and direct outreach protocols, and we want to put them in our software. Now, they had 25 programmers, you know, millions in um, investment, (laughs) you know, capital. Uh, And and I said, so we'll put those things in your software and and you'll run the whole thing. They said, yes. I said, absolutely. (laughs) Brilliant. And their software is a phenomenal keep in touch 
uh, software, but now what you can do is make introductions, you can share information, you can even catalog all your articles inside the system, and um, you can categorize people in these buckets based on the way that I describe uh, and define in Book Yourself Solid Illustrated. And um, each day the, the system will send you the five people that you're supposed to stay in touch with, and it will remember it, and it'll, the algorithm will cycle them through in the appropriate uh, number of days, etc., um, and it's 19 bucks a month, I think. I think that's what it's at now. Awesome. But you can get a 30 day, 30 day free trial if you go to contactually.com forward slash BYS. But you have to go to that link to get the Book Yourself Solid Protocol. Contactually.com forward slash BYS. Love it. We'll, uh, we'll link that up in the show notes as well so people can, oh. can get and there look, too for look, sure. I always, I always tell people look, I'm not making a fortune off, you know, off my. <laughs> association with this right i'm making a couple bucks a month you know it's uh, off it if you decide to use it so this is not where i'm generating my revenue i want you to use this i want everybody that i serve to use this because it's going to help you get book solid it makes these book yourself solid uh networking and direct outreach strategies really easy so that you do them mm. because our job our job is not to sell stuff our job is to get people to consume the stuff we sell them. Mm. Because if I sell Book Yourself Solid to somebody, you know, if they buy it from Amazon or Barnes & Noble, wherever, ch chapters, then, well, again, you know, that's great. I made a sale. But if they don't do something with it, if they don't read it, then there's virtually no value to them and there's virtually no value to me. Uh, no, exactly, absolutely right. Because there's obviously, the, you know, the, the book is, for most authors, like, it's a lead generation tool. And, you absolutely. know, and the, Let's be transparent about it. It's it's you want people to consume the book, so then they continue on with you for whatever the, the next book, the next program, the workshop, the lecture, the seminar, whatever it might be. So you, you want them to actually go through that. Absolutely. And for all of what we do, every product and service that we sell, we should be focusing as much on getting them to consume it, getting them to use it, to do something with it, as we do getting them to buy it. And I think that's where you get the big referrals. Mm. that's where you get the kind of satisfaction from the people you serve that uh, compels them to want to send more people. Because if somebody says, um, hey, Pete, you know, I read that thing that you wrote. Uh, no, so Pete, so Pete, if someone says, I read that thing that you wrote and I loved it. It was awesome. Uh, I've been using it. It totally works. And I got the seven people that I'm going to introduce you to because they've got to use it. That's exactly what you want to achieve. But what also happens is, Somebody buys it and reads it and goes, that was awesome. I love it. They put it down. Don't do anything with it. They're not going to refer. No, no. Because they're not going to be able to go to people and say, oh, my God, it works. They might be able to say, I like it, but I didn't really do anything with it. Hmm. So, so that's why it's, it's, it's it is getting people to consume. That's really the key. Let me ask you a question about that, though, about the consumption side of stuff, because I think most marketers, all they sort of have in their worldview is lead generation, not about this consumption mentality for back-end repeat um, transactions. So as a you know, information marketer, because as an author, that's, you know, I guess, technically somewhat what you are, what are some, yep. some, some things you can do to elicit uh, compliance and consumption? Sure. Okay. This might surprise you. If you're doing something that requires work from uh, you know a client, they, they have to do things to to make to produce results. I recommend not having a money back guarantee. Mm. And here's why: I read some research um, that suggested that when people have an option to get out of something, push comes to shove, they generally do. Yeah. But if there's no option to get out, push, push comes to shove, they make it work. Mm. So here's the, here's the study, very simple study. They, um, the study was based on the sale of ceiling fans. Okay. And two different, they, they separated, uh, they, they sold the fan for a certain period of time to a certain number of people with a full money back lifetime guarantee. And then they took the money back guarantee off and they sold it with no money back guarantee, all sales final, same number of people. And then they track these people over time. And what they found is the group who could not get their money back made a stronger psychological commitment to that particular product. 
because they go home, they put it in, and they look at it and say, hmm, give yourself a pat on the back. We made a good decision. Excellent fan. And then they get a new appliance, you know, six months later, and they look at the appliance and the fan, they go, hmm, these work very well together. We made a good choice. But if you can return it at any point, you might have been a little, you know, might have been quicker to buy it. So, you know, buyer's remorse may be a little more likely. But also, you might not make a psychological commitment to it in the same way because you know you can get out. So you put it in, you go, is that the right one? I'm not sure. Honey, you were really pushing me on this one. I don't know. Well, we'll see. And then six months later, they get an appliance and they look at the appliance and they look at the fan and they go, it doesn't go. It just doesn't work. It doesn't go together. Yeah. You should not have pressured me to get that fan, right? So they're not making the same kind of commitment. Mm. The problem, that the first initial reaction I see from that working with people is that they're going to turn around and go, well, it's going to reduce my revenue. It's going to reduce my sales up front. Money back guarantees make me more money. Sure. Yeah, right. And you also have more people. You have a higher attrition rate. Uh, yep. and, uh, and even for people who don't, you know, try to, uh, don't, who don't opt out and try to get their money back, you have less people generally finishing and successfully finishing. Uh, so you have less good word out on the street. Now, for low price point products, for things that are quick, I do a money back guarantee. Okay. But for long term programs, year long mentoring programs, yep. coaching, um, consulting. Yeah, you know, exactly. For um for uh um for my book yourself solid school of coach training, the year long training program, no money back guarantees. Look, if someone's on a payment plan and they stop paying, I'm not gonna take them to court for the rest of their payment, <laughs> even though they signed a thing saying they'll pay, right? That's I'm not gonna do that. So, you know, that's happened once. Once, literally once. I've been doing this for a decade. That's happened once. So not, not that I took someone to court. I didn't take anybody to court. Meaning, so <laughs> that's not cancer yet. No, no, no. Let me clarify that. So, <laughs> um, so, um, so that's that's a start. Yes, it may take longer for people to say yes, but if your sales cycle is really good, if you are making sales offers that are proportionate to the amount of trust that you've earned, if you're having sales conversations at the right time, then the book, the business that you book, is the right business. They are right for the for the offer that you're making to them and the and the offer that they're buying, and they are more likely to be satisfied with the purchase and to continue their work and to fulfill you know all of the obligations associated with it. Mm. So that's one place we start. Second thing, we track everybody that works with us. I mean, we stalk them. <laughs> we have we have these massive spreadsheets that tell us. Every single week, different people in the organization are filling in these spreadsheets um, with information, different in different areas, like different people are responsible for different things. So one person responsible for tracking all the interactions from a particular coaching program in the Facebook group. So we know exactly how many times somebody is participating in the Facebook group every week from that program. Same thing with uh, the calls how many calls they are on uh, every single week, every single month, et cetera, uh, which events they go to, how many events they go to, uh, so on and so forth. And as soon as we see somebody starting to drop off, we call them. Hmm. Figure out a way to make sure that they stay engaged. I spend more time doing this than I do doing marketing. Yep. And, you know, the people you serve love it. Now, again, I'm a, I'm a coach. So part of my job is to get people to do things that they, they really know they need to do and really do want to do, but they're not doing. Yeah. So, um, you know, so that's, you know, so that's, you know, you may not be as relentless about this if you're a landscaper. <laughs> yeah. But nonetheless, nonetheless, that relationship you have getting people to consume, you know, the work that you've done with them. Uh, is so incredibly important. Well, something that, that came to mind as you're talking there that I've heard you say before, which I think is extremely relevant to right now, and I'd love you to expand on it, was this statement you made in a, in a conversation you had recently. And I, I'm probably going to get this wrong a little bit, but it was something along the lines of a lot of business problems are just personal problems in disguise. Yeah. 
That's exactly what I said. Yeah, there you go. I, I take good notes. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is true for really for, for most people, no matter what you do, but especially if you have your own business, your business is going to be an expression of your personality, your way mm, of being. Which can be dangerous for some people. It can be absolutely very dangerous. <laughs> it can be dangerous for me if I let certain parts of my way of being, certain parts of my personality uh, run the company. There's certain parts of my personality that need to be managed so the company does well or else I'll screw it up. So, you know, if you have a real problem with organization, the company's generally going to be disorganized unless you're managing it very well and have somebody else in there to manage all of the organization and keep you uh, to task. Mm. But what, what kind of problem is that? That's a personal problem. You have a problem with organization. It's not path pathological necessarily. I mean, you don't have to go into therapy because you're not organized. <laughs> You just have to make sure that you understand that that is a personal problem and you either have to um, figure out a way to, to overcome that yourself uh, and or get help so that the business stays organized and you manage against that weakness. Mm. If you have a, a really, really strong problem, if, if you're not making enough sales because you're not uh, making the offer uh, consistently and strongly enough, that might be a personal problem. You know, the fear of rejection, that's a personal problem. Mm. So, you know, uh, if you look at most of the things that we run into in our business, if you don't want to look at all your numbers, your financials, if you find it annoying to go look at P&Ls and stuff like that, that's a personal problem. Mm. What's your issue with looking at the money? Absolutely. So that's always where I go first. When something's not working in my business, I don't look first at the tactical aspect or the strategic aspect. First, I look at, is this something that my personality or somebody's personality inside the company who's running that particular thing uh, is, is getting in the way of? And if the answer is yes, then we try to deal with that first. If the answer is no, 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 I don't think it's that. I think this is actually a tactical problem. Let's see what we can do to fix it. I think that's, that's ex extremely wise and it's something that I'm just thinking through in, in some, some projects and businesses uh, that I've been involved in over the years is that you're absolutely right. For it, it is so many times it is a personal thing that's manifesting itself in the business but because it's in this shell of a business, people are looking about tactics and strategy, not about the underlying um, side of things which I think is very, very important. Yeah, Absolutely. The other thing I wanted to get onto was obviously the book. You know, the the book yourself solid, and obviously you've had a, a number of books, the Think Big Manifesto and stuff since then. But you've basically come full circle now, and and book yourself solid is is being re released or or is re released now as an illustrated version, which I love, and I'd love to sort of hear the story about how that came to be and and what why it's different from the original book and and all sure. that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, you know, book yourself solid uh, came out in two thousand and six, and I did a second edition of it in two thousand and ten. Uh, and it's always been really, really popular, and I've been so grateful for that. I've had so much gratitude. But I still meet people who say they bought it and didn't read it. Or they started it and they liked it, but they didn't finish it. And again, remember, I'm all about the consumption, and that drives me nuts. Yeah. And so I would always ask why. And, you know, people would say, look, I'm busy. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's 90,000 words. And, um, you know, I don't really love to read, frankly. And look, Pete, you know, I'm not writing the great American novel. <laughs> this is a book that is designed to offer a particular solution to a particular problem. Mm. So you want the information in it, and you want to be inspired in the process, no doubt. But you would not be reading Book Yourself Solid or Good to Great or The E-Myth, etc., if you were not a business owner and needed the information in it. Unless you're a really crazy insomniac and it's a good thing to put yeah, you to sleep. Exactly. You can't sleep. You want to read every book that was ever written, right? Or you want to read books that put you to sleep. Yeah. But um, so I said, you know, we've got to solve this problem. And, 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 and I d discovered that 85% of people are visual thinkers and learners. Mm. So I said, oh my God, why don't we try to illustrate all these concepts? And I hooked up with this strategist, a visual strategist named Jocelyn Wallace, who did these extraordinary illustrations. And we cut a half to two thirds of the text and represent all the concepts visually now. Now, now I'm not talking about boring graphs, you know. I'm talking about really fun, creative, funny illustrations. Some really cool stuff. And then, 
Yeah, and then the text is used to support those illustrations. Mm, I, I love it. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, and it's been a it's been a huge, huge hit, and I'm just thrilled. And I feel like I can brag on it a little bit because Jocelyn did most of the work. She's the one who illustrated it. Fantastic. Because yeah, so she really, actually was what, at an event you were speaking at and then, and then came up to you and approached you afterwards with the idea? Is that kind of the, the, the story? Yeah, I, I don't remember it that way, but that's the way she tells me, and I'm sure she's 100% <laughs> right. I thought that I went up to her because she, uh, she went to this event and she was drawing on her computer what I was saying in my speech and it was showing up on a screen. Yep. And, and then I thought it was so cool and I, I, that I went up to her afterwards and said, hey, this is really cool. I think we should do something together. And she says, that's not at all what happened. <laughs> she said that she went to the event because she wanted to meet me, so she offered her time to do that. She knew somebody who knew me a little bit and asked him to make an introduction. And then she said, hey, I'd like to talk to you about an idea. And I said, okay, great. Sounds cool. Uh, and then it went, yeah, and then, and then we ended up doing this book together. But I think it's a representation of a great partnership where each person thinks that they had the idea and they got the better end of the deal. That's exactly what I was going to say. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. Well, yeah. well, Michael, really appreciate your time. So let me ask you a, a final question. And, and this is a question that our listeners know that I ask every single person we have on the show. What's the one question I haven't asked you that I should have? What's the one question you haven't asked me, but you should have? Um, that's a really, does everybody sort of Every, uh, yeah. lost for words at Absolutely. first? Like, uh, 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 Absolutely. Uh, uh, that's then why, uh, they try to come up with something really clever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I would say, why I do this? I mean, why, why do you do all this stuff? Why do you write these books? Why do you try to go and teach this stuff? Why do you even care about this? Fantastic question. So why do you do all this? Well, first, I know that I want to help people think bigger about who they are and what they offer the world. That's almost pathological for me. I just have this deep desire every time I'm talking to somebody and I see that their, their small thoughts are, are, are leading the, the way for them, um, that I want, to try, I want to take those small thoughts and just crush them and replace them with big ideas, big thoughts. So it, that's always been just sort of the way that I've been. So it's not some special you know, gift or you know, some sort of utopian thing that, uh, 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 not utopian, uh, um, uh, you know, some, some benevolent thing that I, you know, am doing for people. I want to do it for myself also. So mm -hmm. that's the way that I want to live. And I want all my work to be, uh, based on that. That's number one. Number two, I fully believe that the best marketing for service business owners is full self-expression. Because I fully believe that if you started your own business, you did so in large part because you want to be fully self-expressed. You want to express yourself in your work. You want to be connected to your purpose. You want to have a reason to get up every day to do the kind of work you do. Mm -hmm. And if you feel self-expressed in your work, you'll feel self-expressed in your marketing. If you feel self-expressed in your marketing, you'll feel self-expressed in your work. And there are certain people you're meant to serve and others that you're not. And people know you're meant to serve them when you are fully self-expressed. That's how they can see that you are meant to serve them. And if you water yourself down, they have no idea who you are. And they don't know that you are meant to serve them. Love it. Very, very cool. Well, Michael, Pete, you're, you, are, you are clearly a fantastic guy. Thank you so much for the opportunity. If you ever need anything, just give me a shout. Uh, I'm here for you. Night. And, um, you know, thank you to, uh, uh, to all who've been listening and never take it for granted. No matter how many opportunities I have, I always feel so thankful. Michael, well, uh, thank you very much for your time, mate. Uh, enjoy the boat. Uh, I'd say enjoy the storm, but that's kind of counterintuitive. But uh, we'll chat soon. Actually, the storm's kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Pete. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers, Michael. Okay, folks, I, I hope you enjoyed that as, as much as we did. Uh, Pete certainly enjoyed himself during the call. Um, <laughs> I, I'll let you into a little behind-the-scenes thing. Pete mentioned before, before, the, uh, before the interview that, uh, that I had a bit of a job editing it. I'll tell you, there was one point in there that I had to edit out a good maybe two or three minutes of real serious weather noise. There was a serious storm going on there outside that boat. 
Um, and I, I, th- I think he did a really good job of not giving it away. He was very calm and collected, despite the fact that he was on a boat in the middle of a pretty major storm, wasn't he? It was quite funny. At one point, he literally had to, um, yeah, as you said, sort of stop the interview and go and like yeah. tie um, certain things down and sails down and close certain windows and lock certain things. It was getting pretty crazy. I'm sitting here going, oh, my God, he's going to die while I'm talking to him. <laughs> But he, he was so calm about it, wasn't he? He was yeah. very calm, very, very matter of fact. Would you mind if I just stepped out for a moment? And then he came back and carried on. Yeah. Um, brilliant. But there was some great stuff in that. I love the thing. Um, I love his perspective, and I could always hear it in your voice, his perspective about don't offer offer refunds. Mm. That was quite that was quite a different perspective on something that you know we talk about a lot. But uh, there's definitely some, some really good takeaways out of that. And um, I, I was well worth the wait. And uh, well worth him persevering through the storm, quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Cool. Excellent. Well, just like uh, just like last week, this week, um, we actually have uh, another bit of feedback from a listener. Um, you know, we started picking out our speak pipe messages from over on printermedia.tv. If you've got something to, uh, to to give us feedback on from the show, you can pop to printermedia.tv anytime and leave us an audio message. Um, and Donnie Price from Oklahoma left us a message recently. Um, so let's have a quick listen. Hello, Pete and Dom. This is Donnie Price. I'm from Oklahoma in the United States. I just wanted to call and say thank you very much for the entertainment that you guys provide and uh, the educational value as well. I've learned a whole lot, and I'm only about halfway through your podcast that you've uh, that you've done thus far. So um, I was just gonna just give a shout and uh, and 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 thank you guys. Keep up the great work, and I look so forward to uh, to seeing what you guys are doing in more of a real time fashion. Great days. Well, uh, thank you, Donnie. Really appreciate uh, you know listening to the show and uh, taking the time to connect with us uh, over on the website. So, uh, mate, rock on and uh, get through the rest of those episodes. Absolutely, you're not alone, Donnie. We get a lot of people saying that they they kind of gone back and and uh, catching up. So uh, there's a little bit to catch up because we're now over 100 episodes. But keep going. Uh, it's worth it. Well, we like to think so anyway. Yeah, and, and <laughs> the thing I was going to mention is obviously um, when we had our 100th live show uh, a couple of weeks back, we obviously asked the audience uh, who was there during the live recording what their favorite episodes was. And, you know, it still stands out to be the Seven Levers episode, which is really, really cool. So if you haven't heard the episode uh, on the Seven Levers, make sure you do that. Um, but either way, we've got a full report now. We've actually turned that um, whole framework uh, into a report people can download and start implementing in their business straight away. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, it's available at sevenleversreport.com, uh, number seven leversreport.com. Um, just you know, throw your email address in there and you uh, can get the, uh, the um, download version. And I'm going to be working on an audio version over the coming uh, few days as well. So hopefully within the next probably couple of weeks, I would say that'll be uh, roughly uh, available as well. And we'll let you all know how you can get a copy of the audio uh, version of that report too. So uh, yeah, amazing feedback so far on that. Um, people have been spreading that and sharing that because they've seen the value in it, which is uh, which is really, really cool. Cool. And uh, I'd Hopefully you'll check the weather outside before you start recording, so it's easy for me to edit that, Pete. <laughs> Very true. Very true. <laughs> okay, folks, a couple of uh, standard stuff now. We're getting pretty pretty regular with some of these things. Um, first of all, a reminder that uh, you can always join in our current competition, whatever's going on, over at preneurmarketing.com forward slash win. Uh, it's whatever's going on at the current time, whatever whatever deals we've got, whatever we've been able to get from the authors that have been on the show as giveaways, you can enter there. Do check back regularly because the contest changes as we get new things to give away um, and more chances to win if you share the contest with your friends. Mm. So definitely pop over and do that. And as always, uh, we are eternally grateful for everyone that listens to the show we love that audio feedback that people are starting to leave more and more regularly now over on preneurmedia.tv so do pop over there preneurmedia.tv is the home of the podcast where you can find all the back catalog of shows you can listen to them online you can download them you don't need to be 
uh, have iTunes or whatever, you can listen to online or download them directly. We work through and put transcripts up on there and also video versions of each show. So pop over to preneurmedia.tv, try that out. Oh, and of course, all the links for all the shows are available there too. And also... Obviously, the podcast is available on iTunes, and you can leave us a review on iTunes in your particular country. Um, And as we mentioned last week, I still don't think we've got anybody from Greenland or North Korea um, in our (laughs) listener base, Pete. So so Uh, we'll get there one day. We will will reach all corners of the globe. We will reach all corners of the globe. But for right now, we're very happy with the audience we have. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and uh, we'll see you all next week. Ciao. You've been enjoying another fine episode of PrinterCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gosher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at printermedia.tv or drop them a line via printercast at printergroup.com.